This film centres itself around Jim Schofield's process and productions of abstraction. Uh, the diagram tells us the history of how mankind has employed various abstraction techniques to try and understand the reality around him. So the diagram begins by placing man in reality and the first thing that man does obviously is observes that reality and so our first process is observation. Yeah, you can see from the way the diagram's building up that uh, you go from man out to reality where observations are made and noted. So by the time you get to that first circle observations, images of what's been seen are in that man's head mm. and he's going to do things with it. Mm. You know, just having lots of images in your head makes it difficult to tell anyone else about them, doesn't it? Mm. So, in fact, the important part of all language is the naming of various observations. Mm. So that, that's the next stage. And that, that in itself is, is an abstraction from reality because you're taking something you've observed uh, and giving it a name. That, that, is, that is a process of abstraction straight away, isn't it? Yeah, you don't get the name from reality. No. You invent it in some way. Yeah. Once man has made observations and, and named the things that he's observed, he then begins organising them into categories. Yeah, once again you'll notice that we go from man through names into reality. We're now equipped with observations that have got names. And we look at various ones and see if they relate to one another. We see if they're of the same type. Yeah. And when they are, we say they're of the same category. Yeah. We give the category a name as well as the individual thing. So organising reality into abstract categories is a, is a fundamental cornerstone of how we, be, how we began to understand things. You have to, um, yeah, you've got to be able to talk about it, you've got to be able to think about it. Yeah. And but you can only do that if they've all got labels. Before we really knew what to do with those labels, um, we made uh, certain wrong assumptions about what we were observing, naming and categorising. And that leads us into the myth section. Of yeah, the we, we look for reasons um, for these things. We didn't believe that they just happened by chance. Uh, we thought that it, there was so much structure there, there were so many rational things about reality, that we thought it was designed. Yeah. And we were really using a self-image, the image of a man as an active person. And we put it into a supernatural being, yeah. God, say. So religion arose with all sorts of religious reasons mm. for the world as it is. Mm. Um, not all the, the reasons uh, at that stage that we gave to these things were religious though, and that leads us to speculative models, which was another way we attempted to understand these things that we'd categorised. Extremely important. We shouldn't play down the myth section, because it is part of the process of abstraction. Mm. We started trying to analyse things into their parts. Mm. For instance, the very first Greek way of looking at things that was, was that everything was made of earth, air, fire and water. Mm. Uh, it isn't mm. true, of course, no. but it was, it was the first attempt and the first conception of analysis. Mm. And then the next stage on, on mankind's journey to, to try and understand the reality around him was they began measuring reality um, and that leads us to a new section uh, yeah that's right it, it, quite apart from recognizing them and, uh, and dreaming up possible reasons or causes uh, it was decided that it was important to start measuring them as they change quantitatively mm. Mm. Uh, and that led to quantitative data mm. and it was in quantitative data that we were able to go further Mm. and find other things. Well, th this is the beginning of science, really, isn't it? This is when um, we're starting to apply more rigorous processes to what we're observing to try and get to the real truth behind them, rather than everything being speculative. That's right. And in fact, once you actually looked at your um, quantitative data very carefully, you could find patterns mm. between the variables and that uh, meant that you began to have enough information 
to use it. Mm. Once we have this quantitative data, which we've uh, successfully measured from a domain of reality, what do we then do with that data? What's the next process? Well, you'll notice there's a lot of arrows coming from man to mm. a new uh, production, which is called objective relations. Mm. One of which goes via the data that we've gathered. Mm. Uh, and the idea is to see what the patterns are in that data, to see if we can use it to predict things. And that's what objective relations are about. They do enable us to use data to tell us what can come next. Mm. I also see that uh, we have an arrow going from man through objective relations into reality where, where those objective relations are then used. So. Um, what would be an example of that? What's that in relation yeah, to? Yeah, well, in fact, as soon as you've got uh, structured data, you can use it to predict. Uh, because you can say this is going up twice as at the rate of that. Hmm. So you can take it into use and, and increase something and notice that the other thing will go up twice that rate. So you can use it even at that stage, long before you've gone into anything very complex or fancy. So those objective relations can also be used to create analogistic models and we have an arrow going through objective relations to reality and then creating these analogistic models. Yeah, that's pretty important because what we're bringing in is not just the data that we've gathered, but other things that happen in reality that show similar patterns. We use them as analogies we see if we can fit the analogy to the new situation the way it fitted to the old situation that we have seen many times before. So those are extremely important. And they are the scientific way to make models. There are other ways to make models, but that's the scientific way, by analogy. And this is where you can start to uh, formulate theories based on the data you've gathered and, and modeled, isn't it? Yeah, I would call that production and logistic model theories mm. not as an alternative title mm. because we can bypass that mm. you will notice the arrow coming from man and going through objective relations bypassing the analogistic models going straight to maths forms mm. now this is important because it does not return to reality mm. it's using as its basis the objective relations and it's turning them into formulae, equations. And because it doesn't go back to reality, that's why we call this section uh, ideality. Yeah, ideality is the sector where, or world where maths reside, where form alone, pure form alone, mm. here, is the only thing that exists there. Mm. Now that tells you really quite a lot about what mathematics is. It is only about form, it's not about content, it's not about cause. Mm. And this diagram makes that very clear and names the sector ideality. Mm. Despite the fact that um, ideality uh, doesn't go back to reality as a reference point as it does in, in the science sector, we can still use those math forms in reality uh, as long as it's in specific domains. That's right. If you remember, we talked about domains when we were getting our quantitative data. Mm. Uh, so we had a, a kind of farmed area of reality. And if we uh, repeat that farmed area in reality, we can now use our equations that came from that data mm. with certainty, with confidence. And that is shown here by three examples of different domains using formulae. Mm. And that leads us also to our final process, uh, which is called New Entity, Process 10. Um, could you explain what that is? This is perhaps the most important, because since the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, certain scientists have said that they don't trust analogistic theories at all. Mm. They won't have anything to do with them. They only trust equations. Mm. So instead of going to reality to find out things, they go to equations and they find things that happen in equations 
and they say that they're caused by some entities. They give these entities names and they give them properties, but they've been derived from an abstraction only, so they're in ideality notice. Yeah. Now they also do a sleight of hand because they take those and you'll see the arrow going back into science and into analogistic models. Yeah. They use those formal entities that were taken from equations, take them into analogistic models and then back to, uh, to the um, maths forms. Yeah. Now that is the trick that the Copenhagen school people do and it's philosophically unsound. You can't do that. Because they didn't find those things in reality, they found them in the equations. I suppose that the assumption that they're making um, is that, that that new entity, uh, which we see as part of being in ideality and, uh, and the creation of our abstract processes, they mistakenly see that as they think that's part of reality they're observing when it isn't. To do. Uh, they insist it is, in fact. Mm. So it's, it's the ultimate abstraction in a way, and that's where, we, where we're at in the world. And it's caused a lot of trouble. A mm. hundred years mm. of impasse in subatomic physics.